capitalism. All of the gains in automation, it goes to the owner class. All you have to do is have everyone be an owner, and now suddenly, any gain in automation is a gain for everybody. If you grow just one thing, it may not grow as well as if it grows with another thing. A good example of that is called the, the Three Sisters Method of Farming. There is definitely multi-apartment buildings or multi-families that do do a passive A hundred million dollars that they gave to Joe Rogan that they would kind of be out if they breach contract. Is that a bigger number? Or is two billion a bigger number? <laughs> It's a tough one, I know. And maybe, maybe comparing numbers is not uh, Jeremy Strong's. Gotta go kill a Jenny. I still don't think you should kill her. I don't think it's a good idea. It's a ghost, dude. Welcome back to Bread Theory. Uh, so tonight we are going to be continuing on our short essay, leftist theory, uh, Wednesday night journeys, and we're going to be reading. Uh, Probably just the first half. We probably won't make it past the first half of Ur Fascism by Umberto Eco, Part One. And uh, before we get into it, joining me tonight is my lovely wife Amanda. How are you doing tonight, Amanda? Hello. You probably okay. gonna, probably gonna have to speak louder than that. I oh. apologize for any uh, background noise, but it is really hot still, so we have to have the air conditioner on. It's gonna be real hot. <laughs> Today is gonna be real hot. <laughs> it's that dopey Carol from. Uh, Cheryl with the bum knee. Cheryl with the bum knee. And Broadcasting out of her garage. Yeah. Hey. Hey. If there's a will, there's a way. And if there's weather, it's today. Wow. <laughs> I'm doing a good stuff. I'm just kidding. You're very funny. You know. Um, I do think so. Let's, let's get you more in frame. There you go. Okay. All right. So, Umberto Echo, this is, this is one of the classic short texts. Uh, about trying to identify fascism as it is rising uh, before it becomes too powerful. This is uh, a man who lived through uh, Mussolini's Italy. Uh, so Mussolini, Mussolini and his, his party were the ones who, who coined the term fascism. The word itself is it just means a bundle of sticks that is bound together. And the idea is that together you are stronger. Um, and then they also added an axe head to it, which I guess means together we can just slaughter everybody. So that's fun too. But basically they, they were, uh, if you're familiar with, say, like the Nazbols or the National Socialists, they, they believed in some facets of, of socialism. They believed in unions to a certain degree. In fact, uh, uh, Mussolini started out his political career as a socialist and then moved into fascism but they believed it only for a certain group of people and then they they hearkened back to um you know uh, the history of rome and, and stuff like that that's where the roman salute comes from which is the nazi salute uh as well and uh and yeah so oftentimes i believe this text is a little bit misinterpreted as it's as being a checklist because he's going to go through a bunch of points uh to kind of break down how he sees the different facets of fascism and if you look at it as just like well you have to have this and this and this and this and this thing otherwise it's not fascism i think you're missing the point these are just better thought of as as red flags so if you notice you know a, a strong appeal to an imagined tradition from the past and rejecting modernity um or if you notice, uh, oh, it's been a long time since I've read this, so I don't remember all the, the different points. But if you notice any of the other points, think of them as red flags, as things that you could, you know, pause and say, hey, maybe, maybe this is a, a fascist movement that's taking place or something akin to it. Because that's the thing about fascism is it will kind of superficially just uh, latch on to memes or, or, or you know, Things that are in the cultural zeitgeist of the day, um, even ideas, you know, political ideas that end up being opposed to it, all in the name of, of gaining more power. That, that's how I ultimately view fascism as, as an exercise in accumulating as much power as possible by whatever means available. So if that means using some people that, that are into things like, say, socialism and then discarding them 
the moment that they no longer serve you, as w as what happened with the Nazis, and uh, the um, forgetting the name, but the, the the socialist wing of the Nazi Party were the first to be uh, mass executed and, and shipped off to concentration camps because they were no longer politically useful in gaining more power. Um, so it, it makes fascism hard to pin down. Um, I've also heard it defined as, as capitalism in decay. I think that is a useful way of looking at it as well, uh, especially as we see today. Uh, the, the wheels of the neoliberal experiment are, seem to be coming off. It's, it's harder and harder to keep Western-style capitalism going because you know, people are just we're running out of people to exploit hard enough to, to make that, that profit for the, the owner class. Uh, inward act of colonialism. I like that too. I like that too. Uh, so yeah, you're right. So so, what we see is capitalism kind of turning towards cannibalizing its own future. You know, it's uh, it's it's groups like BlackRock investing in houses to the point where houses are grossly inflated now. Uh, but people still need places to live. So it's just going to keep on squeezing and squeezing and squeezing people until something has to give. But they're, they're, they're taking something that everyone needs and squeezing as much money out of it in the short term um, without much thought to the future because you kind of have to have customers at some point to keep things going. But if everyone is, is just getting poorer and poorer and not being able to afford basic necessities, you, you've undercut yourself for the future. What what are your thoughts on fascism? What 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 comes to mind when you hear the the term? World War Two. Cool, uh, but like in terms of a like a political ideology, if it even has a unique one. I mean, I think it. This is gonna probably make someone mad, but I'm gonna say it anyway. To me, it just simply bears a lot of that. Like, don't question me. Don't question this mentality that Christianity often presents mm, mm -hmm. and a lot of other religions which I as a child was told the opposite of that like question everything question and everything. if people start shutting down your questions then it's time to go because they're not able to back themselves up right they're, they're full of shit yeah right. that that is and, an, an important part of it I'm sorry I didn't mean to cut you off I didn't mean to cut you off I thought you were. Woman. Continue then, milady. <laughs> no, it's just this like, you're not allowed to ask questions. You're not allowed to uh, accept anything that's different than the norm. Where I was taught, like, if you see something that's out of the norm, ask questions about it. But, like, talk to. The person that's different or whatever that's going on right. that's different so that they can explain it to you not someone else yeah and and you raise a good point that there are a lot of overlaps between uh very uh, i hate to use the word authoritarian but very controlling uh versions of of religion and and fascism itself they often complement each other and use one another to right. gain and to, to stay in power like oh you have to be part of this group yeah these are the good people and yeah. it's like bullshit well they, they'll like, invoke like the 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 old days when christianity was reigning supreme but like stuff like that again when you question the old days and some of the things and why these things needed to change and then they get all like ha, don't like like i'm not doing it to be a jerk i'm challenging your thought process right Right. And, and yeah, that, that's right. Uh, um, we're, that, that's, that's what we've been trying to say is that it's not one fixed ideology. It's very hard to nail down. And, uh, this was all to preface Umberto Eco's work because so many people just take it as a, a checklist, whether, where it would be like, you know, unless you have these 12 characteristics, you can't call it fascism. And I'm, and but... I, I'm trying to flip that on its head and say, no, these are just red. This is a list of red flags to look out because each, time uh, it, it manifests it's going to manifest in a different way because its rise to power has been through making different you know strategic alliances and stuff like that and amanda was saying that that it, it bears it often bears a lot in 
in uh, similarity to very you know authoritarian sorts of religions that are like you cannot question this otherwise you're a heretic and we'll throw you out and in fact i believe that is one of uh, echo's points is that you kind of have to believe contradictory things at the same time uh, yeah. for instance that the enemy is is simultaneously incredibly uh Powerful degenerate the same yeah, yeah yeah you, you know they're degenerate they're the 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 uh they're less than human they they they're not like the strong proud you know western man or whatever and at the same time they've somehow uh taken over the entire world and and they're so powerful that they have to be defeated immediately so you have to hold those two contradictory views at the same time and i don't know if it was him or, or others who have said that that could be a, a feature rather than a, a bug because what better test of loyalty than being like, are you so loyal that you will believe literally opposing things in order to stay with us? Will you just swallow everything? Um, so, yeah. Anyway, so Blatt says, that's one reason I don't think folks should rely on Umberto. Okay, oh yes, this is just an introductory text for sure. Given what Echo normally wrote, it's so strange to me that, that people use him near exclusively. Yeah, definitely should not. This should be your introduction. Just a way to kind of start noticing things that may have been hiding in plain sight in your world and be like, oh, wait a minute, that is kind of weird. That's kind of like, you know, point number six. Maybe I should but, investigate f further. But yeah, this is not I the mean, end all be all by any means. I think that's like a universal application. Like, Yes, you're definitely usually given a list of signs and symptoms of things. But you don't necessarily have every single one of the things on the checklist. But if you have 75% of them, or what have you, then signs usually point to yes. Yeah, right. I mean, you can right. say it with... Hey, James. The, I mean, I don't hate the term checklist, but... That's well, checklist. My... <laughs> like checklist, just in, in like you know, yeah, uh, maybe a bingo card would be better. Like if you don't get every one right. of these things, then okay. you can't call it a bingo. You can't call it it uh, fascism. Maybe that'd be a better analogy, even though that's that's still not perfect. But uh, like um, I get, I get the point though. Hi, James. But there, yeah, there's another one that I I read that was a lot more in depth, and I'm gonna see if I can pull it up real quick. I think it's just called What is Fascism? Uh, who is that? Jason Stanley Snyder. Hmm. I'll have to go back and look. There was another one that was a lot more cons comprehensive that I felt covered it better, more thoroughly. I should say, not not necessarily better, because this is a good introductory text. Um, but yeah, let's just let's let's uh, take it for what it is, and not put on more than it is due. All right. So without further ado, I think we'll get into it. As always, any questions, any comments you have, feel free to shout them out in the chat, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you you might have. As best I can. Um, I think we should mention. Yeah, let's do the let's let's first actually. Sorry, didn't mean to have a false start. But I'm so sorry. <laughs> but we're gonna be sharing your bread first. Is that okay? Sure. Or are you just that that dying that itching to get into it? So, guess what, guys? If you haven't heard. I mean, I make shit besides bread, but I think... Is new stuff? Yeah, yeah, there it is. There's the new stuff. Ooh. So we're exploring, or I'm exploring, seeded sourdoughs. And should you decide that you are just dying for a loaf... And you want to support the show more. And you want different kinds of seeds, message me and I will custom bake you whatever makes your little heart sing, because... I appreciate it. I'm having a yeah. hard time just trying to navigate this pricing yeah. aspect. Because... Well, the, and the, the big hurdle is is the shipping part of it because we can't get any sort of a bulk rate. 
We don't, and it's not, it's not as though we have distributors or anything like that. Yeah. So I am distributing. I am marketing. Yeah, she's, I am she's the whole the whole thing. <laughs> I I'm every woman. There you go. It's Getting ready for karaoke me. night. Um. So yeah. So shipping is is a little more expensive than than for most items. But you know, you get a three four pound loaf of of really dense, delicious bread. <laughs> and, it's very uh, crusty. Yeah. If if you slice it thin enough, it could last a really long time because they're big pieces. You know, they they. When I have it for breakfast, like I did this morning, it, it holds me well into lunchtime. So you get a lot for it, but just, just expect shipping if you're anywhere in the U.S. or Canada to be around $10 per loaf. And uh, we haven't really figured out what the, the magic number you'd have to order to get a reduced rate, but it's probably up there somewhere. But anyway, and then also just remember that each one of these is, is handmade. Uh, it takes a lot of labor to, to produce it, so, you know. It's Lurch babysitting. Right. Lurch is, Lurch, Lurch is the name of her sourdough starter. Um, so, yeah, so uh, we've been selling them for around $20. That includes shipping. Um, and Like, they're big. Yeah, they're, I'm they're not, large. Like, like you, you, yeah, you should do a post with some something for scale. Next well, you to need it. to, like, be my Here photographer. Here we go. Yeah, you see like a, a bottle of cooking oil. A bottle of cooking oil. Most people know about what size that is, or they can imagine it. You know, next to a, a stack of loaves there. Um, we don't have that many pictures. Like, this is all just by itself. The, there's a standard size dinner plate. So you can get a feel for just how big it is. And that's a thick one, too. But anyway, it's, a, it's another way to support the show and support what we do and stuff like that. So that's the main purpose. So, track me down on Instagram. Yep. I haven't made a Facebook page yet. I'm, I'm working full time now, so it's been kind of difficult to it juggle. It is. It is hard to do marketing stuff when you're when you're working full time. Yeah. But there's there's the link for Instagram, so you can go follow. Ouija bread. It's so spooky. But it we're is, always rising spooky. to the occasion. <laughs> yep. Uh... So, the other thing I wanted to tell you all about is in just a couple of days, 9 p.m. Central Standard Time, live only on this uh, channel, well, actually only on the Twitch stream of this channel, because we're not, we're not streaming any other place for this because special we event. Because we can't. Because <laughs> yeah. we can't. Can't stream there. Do you, you want to go ahead and tell them what it is then, since you seem excited about it? Uh, I'm trying to piece it together. It's hard. Oh, so, Shanika. Karaoke. Hey, Shanika! Yeah, leftist karaoke night is, is happening. We'll bring Shanika on. Hey, Shanika, how's it going? Hey, how are y'all doing? Good, 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 good. So, uh, we're just uh, talking about leftist karaoke night. And really? Yeah, I know. I know that you are excited about that and, and going to sing your heart out, right? Oh my gosh! Yes, I am so excited. I was literally like looking for karaoke online somewhere forever, yeah. and y'all are gonna do it. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> oh, that's great. So yeah, we have. Um, oh, I'm getting an echo from you. Oh, I'm sorry. I set my phone down. Is it still echoing? No, that's better. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Good. So anyway, we, we, we have... Oh, no, it's still echoing again. Oh, crap! <laughs> Everything that happens with my phone, I can't do it. Um, I don't know what I'll do. I think I have to sign out and maybe sign back in on my laptop. Okay. Okay, okay. be right back. See you in a second. <laughs> so anyway, the, the, the uh, event is listed in Facebook, but it is only taking place on Twitch. Uh, that's for copyright reasons, because with Twitch, you can do live events that, that you don't have a VOD saved to, which is a video on demand. Um, what? Is that a neighbor messaging you? Huh? On Facebook? No. No. Oh. That's a different group. Oh, yes, me. <laughs> anyway, the, the invite is on... Facebook, just because it's a place to, to keep invites, but the, the event itself will only be on Twitch, because it'll be live only, 
and if it's a success, which it looks like it's going to be, um, then we'll we'll make it a regular thing. But we already have, I think, almost ten people signed up to sing, and a lot of people that are interested, like you know, thirty, forty people that have said they're interested. So hopefully, a bunch of them will will show up in the audience. But if you do want to sing, go to this this event page and, and make sure to get your song in so you can get on the list. And uh, yeah, and then just whether it's uh, one at a time or whether we have a bunch of people all at once singing together, duets, whatever you want to do. Uh, if you want to have just people on screen as, as your live audience so that you can have people to clap for you and stuff like that, that that's cool too. Um, or if you just want it to be only you and, and you know, take that entire limelight yourself, that's that's totally fine. Uh, but it should be a real fun time, just a couple of days. So get signed up. So Blatt says, I found gluten-free fry bread recipe. Oh, interesting. It was supposed to be non-bread, but it came out more like pancake-shaped biscuits. So I'm Ooh. still not baking, but I'm making a lot of bread now. That's really cool. Awesome. Congrats on that. It's kind of fun to just explore, right? Like, right. you really get to know a lot. And apparently, like, despite people not really going hog wild on bread in the summertime, it's actually the best time to make it because it's so humid. Lurch is really into that. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're about ready to get started then. So, I... I'm, I think Shanika said she was going to come back on her laptop, yeah. but... Um, well, I'll keep my eye peeled. Yeah. Usually makes a little sound. Yeah, we usually get an alert, so hopefully she'll be able to just jump in. But because it's broken down into points, it should be pretty easy to just jump in at any point. So yeah, so we're going to... Our goal is to get out there, you know. Speak of Shanika, here she is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, we love. Hey. We were just talking about you. We we're like, she's coming back. I know she's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta smash it as fast as I get here. Where's my bread? <laughs> I need I bread. know. I know. I gotta I gotta figure out pricing because I don't like the number that I'm coming out with, but shipping is so G D expensive. I wanna like, see if I, I can get a better other, deal. I looked at other pricing and like they've got like crazy huge prices. So if it's coming out to be like I can't remember how much, but like some crazy 30 40 dollars or something like like that like if no you look on etsy it's yeah yeah they're nuts i'm yeah. thinking like 20. yeah i think that's more than fair because you know you're, you're spending like an hour of your time to make each one of those loaves and well at, at ten dollars yeah 20 yeah okay so I think i'm gonna start there <laughs> i'm just as your as somebody who would honestly like buy from you again mm -hmm. based on and also just sort of just not even like i'm playing the devil's advocate honestly mm -hmm. based on what's out there like if you were a contractor and you had to get bids you'd have to be able to demonstrate that your price lands within the range yeah. and if right. your upper range starts creeping towards 45 and your lower range is like what you said 20 or whatever and then you mm -hmm. also look at the fact that like what i'm using right now using right is um like I use bread, okay. I need bread. Oh, I got right. Dave's killer, killer bread or something. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, I've I've heard of that, but I can never find it up here. I want to try. I've it. seen it in the stores before. I it might be at Hy-Vee actually. We should check next time we go. Got you said I too? can't shop. Yeah, there. we got Hy-Vee. I didn't say we can't shop there. I just don't like going he to a store for one single there. item. Having to go well, all the way two. up to the store. Now it's two. Okay, now that it's two, I guess we can go. <laughs> the my coffee own. creamer. <laughs> what coffee creamer do you like? The Wide Awake non-dairy coffee creamer. Yeah, it's that's pretty called, good. It's called Wide Awake? Yeah, yeah, it's got a squirrel on it. Big crazy eyes. <laughs> and it's non-dairy. <laughs> coffee is out the frame. Have you seen Liquid Death? Oh, yes. yes. We just got into that. Those are really so good. So good. Are you serious? Especially oh, yeah. after a the hike. flavored ones are really good too. You like know you what? know, I got an A &W, uh, zero sugar root beer. Let me crack that open right now All as right. I'm eating my veggies. And tomorrow, I think I'm going to get some like severe liquid death. Mix it with some wide awake. 
you know. There you go. Get the that's lime a... one. Oh yeah, severed yeah. lime. Severed lime. Really good. There's a mango too, if that's your jam. But... And a berry one. Did, did they come out with the snortable ones yet, or are we still waiting? Because <laughs> like, <laughs> we, just, we just need to have a whole. We just have need to have a meeting and just break out and be like, you know, yeah. And that which <laughs> God cannot, you know, prevent. But no, seriously, that um, that Dave's. I'm gonna tell you something. Like, I'm too opinionated for my own good. No, I love I'm the saying, bread. Tell me. <laughs> Dave's killer bread. I love it, but I just think Dave is a douchebag. Like, why the fuck is you gonna name my bread killer? Like, it's so mm -hmm. good, but it's killer. It's I like killer, bro. I want to actually go with the we know you guy, but we're gonna get. There we right. go. I, I mean, that's all. <laughs> I mean, I'm making jokes, but I'm also saying that I really would rather buy. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> Sneak has been a great customer. One yeah, of our first. Know, please look at your pricing; it's pretty higher. Just like yeah, that. yeah, definitely. Just, why don't you cruise, pay, cruise, cruise around Etsy? Huh? See what people are charging for similar yeah. products, and and yeah. set it somewhere around there. I think that's I mean, only I'm fair. I'm just saying, like okay. woman to woman, business folk, and all that. Like, yeah. I I used to be a contractor, so some stuff. Sometimes I get like way too into this conversation with people, but. If I see somebody like leaving money on the table, as far as like you, you're doing a, a, a function, I can't function. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm dumb and we are the champions. Just the fact that I act, I'm actually eating today because I either forget to eat or forget to cook or forget to do something. Yeah, I'm just yeah. But if you and Lurch can get it together and you know pump out you know wave after wave of products, then yeah, you know I just feel like. You know it's crazy. Google Google Assistant is gonna Oops. mishear that and like put me on a list for like. So she's so she's a supplier now. I knew something about her. But um, I, no, seriously, like. Yeah. I got flagged for putting seeded bread. I was like, what was sus about saying seeded bread? I was like, yeah, whatever. Right? It's, it's probably a cult word somewhere. Like, I mean, yeah. bread. I mean, I'm just gonna, bread means money a lot of times, right? So seated that I'm I'm not even yeah. kidding right now. It could mean something for real. <laughs> yeah, maybe, it, maybe it's like well, we need seed money and or something like that. And yeah, don't well. want that sort of thing. Who knows? Dude. Thank thanks for the bits, Alyosha. Yeah. Everyone should go follow Alyosha. <laughs> hey, hey. All right, I'm gonna shout you out in just a second here, Ali. But, yeah, I'm gonna look into that, but I, I'm thinking twenty for now because I'm just a fledgling, and you're my you're my customer. We'll, well put it this way. If you aim lower than so okay, I know I know this is this is the reason why nobody invites me anywhere. This is the only place I'm invited. Oh. And then and y'all are just still oh, I was happy to have here. you. If you pitch out too low. And for real, I'm saying this on from the leftist perspective, from the unity perspective, from the solidarity perspective, mm -hmm. from the Aliosha perspective, like yeah, if you pitch welcome. anything too low. You're welcome, Aliosha. And you're like, oh, you know, imagine me walking into a classroom saying I'm going to teach English to people who are adults and I got to prove to them in five seconds that I can do the job. Mm -hmm. I got to have my chin. OK, I got to have my head up. I gotta have my shoulders back. I can't be like, oh, I'm just starting out. I got to be like, yo, <laughs> you're going to love me. I yeah. don't know if I can do this job, but you're going to love it. I'm going to love it. We're going to get there. You right. know what I'm saying? Right. So yeah. that's all I got to say. Okay, I think I, agree. I think shout my lurch. Shout out to the hustlers. That's right. Shout out to all y'all. Love to love to the sex workers. Sex yep. workers work. Somebody yep. out there is work. like, after, right. especially after after Roe versus Wade. Oh my God, I'm sorry. Oh I'm God. just I'm still triggered. Ain't gonna lie. Okay. Uh, you should be. It's like, not getting is, any better. No, no Democrats trigger. are not doing nothing. No. But uh, let's. Let's get into the book here, because we are uh, we are forty minutes into the podcast, into the I'm show. Zach actually holds a master's degree in awkward transitions. Yeah. He nails it every time. Every time. Every time. Well, here goes. Anyway, here goes. <laughs> this audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. In 1942, at the age of ten, I received the first provincial award of Ludi Juvenas a voluntary compulsory competition for young Italian fascists, that is, for every young Italian. 
I elaborated with rhetorical skill on the subject. Should we die for the glory of Mussolini and the immortal destiny of Italy? No. My answer was positive. I was a smart boy. <laughs> I spent two of my early years among the SS, fascists, republicans, and partisans so shooting at one another, and I learned how to dodge bullets. It was good ex- So this is his uh, edgy boy time, as, as many teenagers go through. So he, he ended up not on that side of the political spectrum, which is good. So we have his uh, experience to, to look at now. Because learning is important. It's fundamental, some would say. In April 1945, the partisans took over Milan. Two days later, they arrived at a small town where I was living at the time. It was a moment of joy. The main square was crowded with people singing and waving flags, calling in loud voices for Mimo, the partisan leader of the area. A former Mariscalio of the Carabinieri, Mimo joined the supporters of General Badoglio, Mussolini's successor, and lost a leg during one of the first clashes with Mussolini's remaining forces. Italian. Mimo showed up on the balcony of the city hall, pasta. pale, leaning on his crutch, and with one hand tried to calm the crowd. I, I, I was waiting for a speech because my whole childhood had been marked by the great historic speeches of Mussolini, whose most significant passages we'd memorized in school. Silence. Mimo spoke in a hoarse voice, barely audible. He said, Citizens, friends, after so many painful sacrifices, here we are. Glory to those who have fallen for freedom. And that was it. He went back inside. The crowd yelled. The partisans raised their guns and fired festive volleys. We yeah, kids hurried okay, to pick up pause. the shells. Precious items, pause. but... What about their fucking families? What about, like... Oh, glory... Well, they, you know, they get to take glory home in a casket and then just, like... Is that where glory lives? Yeah, it, like, feeds them the rest of their life and... You know, takes care of them, acts as a companion. Good old Glory. <laughs> Obviously kidding. I know. Uh, yeah, they, they get dead loved ones for, for a cause that probably didn't serve most of them in the first place. You're going to carry my urn around? Everywhere I go, I'm going to I'm gonna uh, cement it to the, the hood of the car. <laughs> yeah, so that when the wind blows, I can really travel to all I'll those cement the wind down, I've too. Never... So what's the point of a lid? I don't know. Get a dispenser, shake her out like a little bit at a time, man. Ooh, like a Parmesan cheese dispenser? Oh yeah, that's on brand for you. Yeah. <laughs> God. <laughs> so Ali has a question, or a couple of questions. <laughs> Twitch debate seems to be using fascist again. What is the proper and, is that proper and or wise? Well, we, we don't want to be too, too loose with the term fascist and just throw it at, at any sort of conservative of any stripe, or even any liberal, as, as a lot of very diehard leftists like to do. Uh, so you I, I, just I think, call it the F word? Uh, no, I think, I, think, I think what Ali is getting at is, uh, is, it, is it okay to just call everything fascist? Like, are we, are we, you know, are you a fascist or that person a fascist? Um, just sometimes. Just sometimes. Is it appropriate to just start throwing it out there as a term? And I, and I, what I'm trying to say is I think we need to be careful about it and uh, consider it that, that what we're, yeah, being overused. Okay. Yeah, we don't want to overuse it. That's for sure. Not everything is fascism, but uh, a lot of, of right side ideologies either are fascist in, in pretty much every feature, or they lead to, to fascism. Uh, like the, the book that we've been going through on, on Mondays, the People's History of the United States, can make a pretty clear case that, that the way that the Europeans dealt with the natives, dealt with slaves, um, dealt with the underclass was very fascistic, and they often had a, a large dose of uh, religious grounds to, to back up their, their statement as well. So. Yeah, uh, that was not an ideology at the time, but it certainly had a lot of the features of fascism. So I think as long as we're, you know, thinking it through before we just throw it out there and not just saying, I don't like you, therefore fascist. Could we say fascesque? Fascesque, I think is that, yeah, that could be a, a, an important term too for like a lot of the alt-right movements who... Um, you know, maybe don't have a strong stance on, on some particular uh, features of fascism, but bear a lot of the, the same sort of uh, manifestations, like like white nationalism, for example. 
yeah, the fash esque could be a, a an, an important kind of in between word. So SPME one was trying to push the Nazi swastika as a pro fascist symbol. Push the Nazi swastika is a pro fascist symbol. Well, it is, isn't it? What I mean, what do you mean? Are you saying that it's not one? Oh, someone. Some, someone was trying. Someone to. was trying to push the Nazi swastika as a pro fascist symbol. Well, yeah, I, I mean, it pretty much is. You're hearkening back to the, the Nazi party, which was a fascist party. They call themselves, I mean, Nazis stands for National uh, Fascistic they, Party. They so. stole that from Buddhism and flipped or it. National Socialist. Uh, but anyway, it, it, they, are, they are fascist. So well, instead, of, instead of just a symbol of hate... I think, well, I mean, that, that, that gets tricky already because I don't think you can really disentangle fascism from, from a hate-based ideology. Cause but it is because there's fear. I'm saying you can't oh, disentangle sorry, it. sorry, sorry, sorry. Because that always is a feature. That, that, I mean, so when, when countries come into crisis, when the, the economy starts breaking down, this is usually when you see a fascist movement really taking hold and and coming together as a potential way that the entire country goes and one of the reasons is because what it offers most of the time is a scapegoat that is a big feature of i would say pretty much any fascist movement uh i can't think of any sort of alt-right or or alt-light or any other sort of right ideology term that you could apply that wouldn't include fear of an other at least xenophobia as as its scapegoat so you pile all all the, the world's troubles on it and say that it's them who is who is causing the degeneracy in society and so yeah i would see any any fascist symbol as a, a symbol of hate um yeah <laughs> yeah hitler did <laughs> promise to make germany great again. go ahead Question. yeah go ahead so we know that like um, the Christian right is in its own way, you know, ticking a lot of these boxes. Like, yeah. how do you categorize um, religion as fascism? <clears throat> well, as, as we were uh, kind of discussing in the intro to this topic, I think that they have a lot in common. There's, there's a lot of, of features in common between a very authoritarian, strict um, religious movement and a fascist, fascistic movement. In fact, like they often operate in tandem, helping boost each other's power and reach. Because it's like building a collective of like-minded individuals, yeah. establishing a fear, and shutting down questioning. Yeah, yeah, and both are, are about just submitting to authority. Uh, they, 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 they want stability more than anything, and, and that is one thing that fascism and very strict religions both offer, is a, a strong, clear uh, moral voice to follow, for better or worse. Yeah, like, like when, um, <clears throat> when I first heard the word, well, I mean, started actually, like, discussing the word fascism with someone, like, what, you know, what does that mean exactly? Like, what does that mean exactly? You know, and it's... I mean, obviously you're trying to define it, but I was just like, it seems so synonymous with hope ideology that it's hard to even figure out why it's not called that. I know that makes probably no sense, but yeah. You said hope ideology? What, what do you mean by uh, that? Cult. cult oh, cult ideology. ideology. Oh, ideology. yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. A lot of similar features of, of cults and, and, you know, a, lot, a, a tactic to keep you kind of in the cult um, is is common to um, fascism as well is, is the idea that whatever the leader says, even if he contra let's let's be real, it's usually he contradicts himself, um, that you have to believe all of it, everything that they say, and just go along with it, even if they're they're saying things that that you know not to be true. Um, yeah, so you, like Al Alyosha said, like. Um, uh, 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 sorry, Ken, Ken Copeland prayed um, 
to curse anyone who did not help Trump. Like, so it, it's it's almost like politics plus religion equals fascism or something. Like, I mean, yeah, I mean, fascism is is just like the the coalescence of all power structures. So you have corporate power structure in league with with governmental power structure in league with uh, religious, oftentimes power structure. So it's it's because that's what that's basically at its core what fascism is trying to do is amass as much totalitarian power as possible so it will use others that are on that same course to its own advantage to gain that 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 leverage and and rise up in you know in power because that's what it's about it's about amassing ultimate power to then you know vanquish the 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 people that have been uh, scapegoated and when that doesn't work suppress everyone who rises up against them it's just it's it's about as much control as possible um, through whatever means you can so if, if that means uh, working with corporate interests to break unions and strikes and stuff like that then they'll do that so, so fascism is world domination I mean eventually uh, it seems that it would go that far. One of the features of, of fascism in practice, it seems, is that it's incredibly volatile in the end. It doesn't last very long. I mean, we, we talk about Mussolini's uh, uh, Italy lasted, uh, I don't know, five or six years, something like that. The same thing in, in Hitler's uh, Germany. Um, I think perhaps Argentina lasted a little bit longer under that, but eventually because there's, there's so much fear and paranoia that, that, that are features of control in these yeah. systems, eventually it leads to a bunch of factionalism and backstabbing. And, you know, again, when you, when you have this, this sort of a, a prophecy, uh, it, it, and again, it, it's, it's a lot like some of these, these uh, religious, groups that say like, well, the end of the world is going to come this day, this day, or this day. And uh, when that doesn't happen, that tends to sow, you know, uh, discontent and, and people end up leaving the movement. Same thing with fascism. Once you vanquish your enemy and you are, are in complete control and people's everyday lives have not gotten better as a result, things have, have gotten worse mm -hmm. because, you know, it's just not a very good system in any sense of the word. Uh, you, you're going to have people losing faith in it, and then that leads to people being like, "No, this is uh, listen to me instead. I'm I'm the true uh, leader. This 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 guy that you've been following, he's he's weak. He's he's gotten soft in his old age. So you got to follow me instead. And then, you know, there's there's that factionalization, and it just ends up eating itself." Oh my God! Gotcha. Because it can never, it can never keep to its, it can never deliver on its promises, because the the the, the root of people's problems is not, cannot be heaped on one group, any one group. Um, there's a, there's a whole lot of, of complex interactions that that, you know, add to the sum total of of what the world's problems are. We can't just be pinned down to one thing. Even capitalism, you know, it, it, capitalism probably is, is, is the cause of most of the world's problems right now, but it can't, it, it's not all of them. Without capitalism, we, we could still have rampant consumerism. It, it could still be a thing. Uh, or at least we could be producing products at a rate that is unsustainable and, and continues to uh, heat up the globe. Um, without capitalism, there's no guarantee that that racism or xenophobia or homophobia, transphobia, any of these phobias would just disappear entirely. It would certainly make a big dent in all of that because, you know, you wouldn't have to look at your neighbor and say, well, my life is, is shit. It's probably because of them and them getting advantages they didn't deserve. So that, that goes away as a, a cause of friction and just people not struggling as much well, also goes this... away. But it doesn't eliminate all problems. There's too much of this attitude of others to decide what someone else does and doesn't deserve. And it's kind of like, well, fuck you. You have no idea how someone else has been living or how they live. Because not everyone necessarily wants the same shit, contrary to the lie we've all been fed. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know. I feel like there's this heavy air of, like, 
entitlement and everybody wants to be a millionaire and have all these yeah. things and it's like what if i just want to get by yeah what if i just yeah. want to fucking be able to eat yeah we can do that world make my fucking bread and have a roof over my head it's more than enough for everyone to have that sort of a life it's just that yeah. we we choose yeah. to roll those dice just in case we get to be the next elon musk right well, let's just say, capitalism, capitalism. I'm looking at you. All my fucking ass wants to do is stay home and make bread. Yeah. yeah. Literally. Yeah. And that, that contributes to the world in a very material, right? uh, a positive way. And I could be making healthy bread. I could be exploring with yeah, bread for celiacs. Bread, but, but yeah. Yeah. You could be making well, other healthier breads, I too. could. I'd have more time to sure. babysit Lurch and feed Lurch like the good boy he is and yeah. so important <laughs> bread is such absolutely that's the why that's why kropotkin titled his book the conquest of bread because it's it's it, it representation of, of life and and you know civilization and working together and this is why right wingers do keto just kidding what? i'm just kidding <laughs> oh, it's a joke <laughs> Uh, they probably do prefer those sort of fat diets. Because you know, because they're... the body can't process bread. It's just like glue in your intestines. I'm like, right, that's why you get stupid when you do keto because your that's brain's getting sustenance. Well, uh, fascist movements tend <laughs> to be very obsessed with purity and, and you know, purity <laughs> culture. So the, that can extend very easily to dieting. Um, and you know, abstaining from alcohol or drugs or, or uh, you know, working out uh, but, but five times a day and all the, all these sorts of things. It's also feeding into that echo, echo's point of like not liking modernism, right? Yeah. We want to stay of the old way. We want to live as caveman. I'm like, do you see any caveman right now? <laughs> How well do you think that fucking went for them? Because I don't see any. I see oh. a shit ton of vegans and vegetarians and other. Mm -hmm omnivores and stuff that yeah never mind that's not i'm just gonna calm down okay if Jim, james james yeah. says if we got a billion from bread in a year would you buy a boat that is too big to fit under the bridge <laughs> no that's no. oh you know what we're getting james? off on a tangent but that's okay we can we can take this tangent you here. know what i would just buy a house yeah a house that's big enough for us i don't need a mcmansion i might get some bread accessories like a bread slicer instead of Zach almost cutting off a finger every but that, time. But that's the thing is you could spend then you really could decide to spend your time baking bread for people and just giving it away the rest of your life if you felt like. Yeah, I could sustain the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. I could have my little list and be like, oh, Shanika needs four loaves seceded and that, my little old neighbor lady, my little diabetic neighbor lady needs some... Some healthy rye. Some healthy rye. Yeah. <laughs> But, but I mean, that's, that, that's the thing though, like rich people are so pathetic. Like they can't think of anything better to do with their money than get big things. Right. It's like, and that's the problem too, because there's so much power in the world and that's, that's the best you can come up with. I mean, look at spend your time and, and effort on, but also like, I hate, I'm going to sound like a dick, but I'm going to go for it because I'm hoping to get to a point at the end of my being a dick. But like, I think about often my neighbors. In this building not all of them but a lot of them have these really flashy showy vehicles our apartments are not great looking this is not like an ivory tower situation okay it's functional it's shelter and we have a prius again it ain't flashy or showy but it's got great gas mileage but like people that live in this apartment but then Don't pay six hundred dollars on a car payment because they want the flashy showy car because that's what others see right. when they're out in well, society. Like, I don't know. I think it's I think it's internalized capitalist myths that they, they have. Right. Like I'm not you know, blaming the, them, I'm just right. stating that they, this is an observation. They have bought into the idea that, that your worth is, is very much tied to how much money you make and what kind of job you have. So if you can get the trappings of being an, a big important person who makes a lot of money because in capitalism the you know rich people deserve their money because they work harder poor people don't deserve anything because they work less that's that's the myth so they've bought into that myth even though they're still on the poor end as as i would assume they, i mean we don't know all these people's lives maybe they maybe some of these people are rich and and 
they just live in in very you know uh-huh. below market rate apartments i just don't know why you would though if you had a choice true well but... and maybe they save all their money <laughs> Yeah. Uh, uh, by living here, and that all goes to the car. But but, but, but still, I know what you yeah. mean. Yeah. I mean, again, and like he'll eventually build dildo space rockets. I mean, shit, I was gonna fly a baguette to the moon, but <laughs> I guess. But again, it, that's just a monument to their own <laughs> ego. That's all right. they can think to do. Mm-hmm. What can I? What sort of stunt can I do? What can I buy that is so big and ostentatious that everyone just keeps believing that I am a Marbles super genius? That my, oh. Look at you. They're just so boring. Like Nico, the rich are to... actually like the, the entitled are jealous of the disenfranchised. The rich are jealous of the poor. Because in certain like, ways, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, true. you know, because they have better like, thinking skills. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's, it's <laughs> like um, I wish that I had a name for it, but I think that there might even be a psychological phenomenon of like having to it probably have something to do with nihilism i suppose or existentialism but i would say well i guess this is philosophy i'd say you know the idea that everybody kind of either wants um you know the grass is greener on the other side Mm -hmm. or the idea that you want to feel special because of your struggle or you want that like that the whole munchausen's by proxy kind of i'm gonna poison mm-hmm. my kid because i need attention type of shit like yeah. that's what the rich have yeah. that, but, <laughs> but that freaks me the fuck out like just the things that you're willing to exploit but again capitalism well, it's right there yeah see i mean if i had billions of dollars if i mean if there was some way that i could acquire that amount of money Ethically, obviously, you would buy a McMansion. Obviously, and, I would, uh, uh, Aston Martin. Yeah, yeah. That turns into a rocket. But no, after after I paid off all the debt of myself and and my family members, and you know, bought a place to live, and 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 that sort of thing, I would spend it on projects to help people's lives. I would I would build, you know, cooperative housing. Um, I would I would uh, try and help build a better mass transit system for the the Twin Cities. I would you know, invested in a, in a botanical gardens. I would, I would buy up one of the golf courses in, in, in the one. city. Yeah, well, I'd start with one. No, and, I think you need to monopolize. Okay, thanks. <laughs> anyway, I would, I, you know, start a botanical garden. Something that, that, that you know, could be a benefit to everybody. I would, I would start mutual aid networks. Uh, I would, maybe I would start a, a, a third party political party locally. Um, but it wouldn't be going to, to buy in flashy cars and and symbols of, of status. I would probably dress pretty much the same. I'd probably drive the same. So I'm, I'm probably driving an electric car instead if I drove anything. But He didn't mean it, Yeti. Oh, the Yeti is our car, by the way. You're uh, good buddy. But there's, yeah, there's so many more things I could think of to, to devote, you know, ungodly amounts of money to than than just buying shit and then probably not using it most of the time and then once you bought it just get bored with it immediately just get that buyer's remorse because capitalism is you know consumerism the consumerism part of capitalism is just an empty promise you know uh, unless it really makes your life materially better it just having stuff and that having stuff wears off real fast i mean yeah that's like the in that like all of the kind of buddhist or eastern kind of principles where you're you know getting to the you know the minimalism and getting to you know meditating and and Mm -hmm. you know kind of some sort of disciplines some some kind of ascetic practices and Mm -hmm. you know people being happier with less and all that kind of stuff and it's like yeah we we're so misinformed here just growing up like like the reason why i kept asking about fascism is because frankly i mean the the context that i ever heard it you know applied to was always you know hitler Mussolini, and yeah and so on and and i was just okay so you know my very honest question to myself is like huh so it's a lot of white people that are really mad at those white people but they're not getting oppressed in the same way of oh they're mad because they know that that type of person, whatever fascism, fascism means, would mm. do anything to get on top. Like uh-huh. the most, you know, so it's like, 
if you're gonna be hungry for power, you're gonna have to sacrifice every bit of yourself that can feel other emotions like love and empathy and then you get the money, you try to buy it back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, just the ridiculousity of it just, you know, floors me every time. That's it's all. just a, it's a shit cycle. <laughs> it's a shit cycle. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Indeed. But speaking of fascism, why don't we get back into the book? Yay. How was that how was that transition? Still okay, awkward. fine. How how would you transition why then? Why don't huh? you just why don't you just get on with it there, bud? <laughs> but I had also learned that freedom of speech means freedom from rhetoric. A few days later I saw the first American soldiers. They were African Americans. The first Yankee I met was a black man, Joseph, who introduced me to the marvels of Dick Tracy and Lil Abner. His comic books were brightly coloured and smelled good. One of the officers, Major or Captain okay, Muddy, so was a guest in the Books do smell great. Books smell great. Moving and... on. We went 20 Just... seconds, come on. The villa of a family whose two daughters Comment were my below schoolmates. If you feel the same. I met him in their garden where some <laughs> ladies, surrounded by Captain Muddy, talked in tentative French. Captain Muddy knew some French too. My first image of American liberators was thus. After so many pale faces and black shirts, that of a cultivated black man in a yellow-green uniform saying, Oui, merci beaucoup, madame. Moi aussi, j'aime le champagne. A champagne. There was that's no champagne. The, that's all they could Captain Muddy gave me his first piece of Wrigley Spearmint, okay. and I started chewing all day long. At night, I put my wad in a water glass, so it would be fresh for the next day. In May, we heard that the war was over. Peace gave me a... Nope, just... Is it, is, it, is it the issue with the gum in the water glass? I mean, chewing gum is repulsive. So it's, it's not going to work to put it in the water glass. It just makes it harder. Well, it depends. It's a water but high maybe, cold. But, but this is also 1940s chewing gum. It's probably different. didn't have as much plastic in it then. Move it on. A curious sensation. I'd been told that permanent warfare was the normal condition oh my for God. a young Italian. In the following months, I discovered that the resistance was not only a local phenomenon, but a European one. I learned new exciting words like Rousseau, Maquis, Armé Secret, Rote Capel, Warsaw Ghetto. I saw the first photographs of the Holocaust, thus understanding the meaning before knowing the word. I realized what we were liberated from. In my country today, there are many people who are wondering if the resistance had a real military impact on the course of the war. For my generation, this question is irrelevant. We immediately understood the moral and psychological meaning of the resistance. For us, it was a point of pride to know that we Europeans did not wait passively for liberation. And for young Americans who were paying with their blood for our restored freedom, it meant something to know that behind the firing lines there were Europeans paying their own debt in advance. In my country today, there are those who are saying that the myth of the resistance was a communist lie. It is true that the communists exploited the resistance as if it were their personal property, since they played a prime role in it. But I remember partisans with kerchiefs of different colours. Sticking close to the radio, I spent my nights, the windows closed, the blackout making the small space around the set a lone luminous halo, listening to the messages sent by the Voice of London to the partisans. They were cryptic and poetic at the time. The sun also rises, the roses will bloom, and most of them were Miss Sagi Pella Franchi. Somebody whispered to me that Franchi was the leader of the most powerful clandestine network in northwestern Italy, a man of legendary courage. Franchi became my hero. Franchi, whose real name was Edgardo Sogno, was a monarchist, so strongly anti-communist that after the war he joined very right-wing groups and was charged with collaborating in a project for a reactionary coup d'etat. Who cares? Sonio still remains the dream hero of my childhood. Liberation was a common deed for people of different colors. In my country today, there are some people who say that the War of Liberation was a tragic period of division, and that all we need is national reconciliation. The memory of those terrible years should be repressed. Oh. Okay. Sorry. What happened? Huh? What happened? Nothing. I just... I need to not sit in this chair. It hurts. Oh. Sorry. It's okay. I want everyone to say thank you to Amanda for Sorry. putting in this her This chair hates Amanda. me, guys. I'm really sorry. Shanika says thank you. Bye, Shanika. Bye, everybody. You can still participate on chat? Yeah. I'll be telling you what I think. Good. You better stay away from my car, jerk. I don't. <laughs> touch you, don't touch you. Ow. Uh, all right, so so we'll get through this uh, preamble part to his his uh, main work here. 
Refule, verdrangt. But verdragung causes neuroses. If reconciliation means compassion and respect for all those who fought their own war in good faith, to forgive does not mean to forget. I can even admit that Eichmann sincerely believed in his mission, but I cannot say, okay, come back and do it again. We are here to remember what happened and solemnly say that they must not do it again. But who are they? If we still think of the totalitarian governments that ruled Europe before the Second World War, we can easily say that it would be difficult for them to reappear in the same form in different historical circumstances. If Mussolini's fascism was based upon the idea of a charismatic ruler, on corporatism, on the utopia of the imperial fate of Rome, on an imperialistic will to conquer new territories, on an exacerbated nationalism, on the ideal of an entire nation regimented in black shirts, on the rejection of parliamentary democracy, on anti-Semitism, then I have no difficulty in acknowledging that today the Italian Alianza Nazionale, born from the post-war fascist party MSI, and certainly a right-wing party, has by now very little to do with the old fascism. In the same vein, even though I am much concerned about the various Nazi-like movements that have arisen here and there in Europe, including Russia, I do not think that Nazism, in its original form, is about to reappear as a nationwide movement. Nevertheless, even though political regimes can be overthrown, and ideologies can be criticised and disowned, behind a regime and its ideology there is always a way of thinking and feeling, a group of cultural habits, of obscure instincts, and unfathomable drives. Okay, so here even Echo himself is saying, that uh, the right-wing parties that have materialized after World War II uh, don't bear a lot of resemblance, maybe even just superficially, to the, the old fascist party or the Nazi party or anything like that. They have their own forms. And so, like he, he's saying himself, uh, he, it, this is not just a, a uh, I, I call it a checklist, but maybe the bingo card is a better metaphor. You don't have to have all of these facets in order to have what you could consider not um, fascism. Fascism takes many forms. Uh, and so what he's trying to strike at is some of the commonalities that he's seen between a lot of the fascist movements. Is there still another ghost stalking Europe? Not to speak of other parts of the world. Ionesco once said that only words count and the rest is mere chattering. Linguistic habits are frequently important symptoms of underlying feelings. Thus it is worth asking why not only the resistance, but the Second World War was generally defined throughout the world as a struggle against fascism. If you reread Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls, you will discover that Robert Jordan identifies his enemies with fascists, even when he thinks of the Spanish phalangists. And for FDR, the victory of the American people and their allies will be a victory against fascism and the dead hand of despotism it represents. During World War II, the Americans who took part in the Spanish War were called premature anti-fascists, meaning that the fighting against Hitler in the 40s was a moral duty for every good American. But fighting against Franco too early in the 30s smelled sour because it was mainly done by communists and other leftists. <laughs> uh, that's kind of funny. Uh, I would like to, to cover the, the Spanish Civil War. Maybe at some point we'll do um, homage to Catalonia by... Uh, Orwell, because that, that, that's about his time fighting in the, the, the Spanish Civil War. Anyways, was was a precursor to World War II. Uh, this was this is Franco of Spain, so the term, I don't think the term fascism or fascist or fascism had even been coined yet, uh, but, but his party could be considered a, a fascist party and a fascist movement, and it was primarily, as he says, fought against by uh, left-wingers, communists, and primarily anarchists. Um, so uh, there's there's a lot of speculation that if that war had gone differently, that perhaps it would not have emboldened the Nazi party and the fascist party in Italy and and uh, the um, the various fascist movements that came after to actually try and seize power. So yeah, important stuff. Why was an expression like fascist pig used by American radicals 30 years later to refer refer to a cop who did not have of their smoking habits. Why didn't they say Kagula pig, phalangist pig, ustashi pig, quizzling pig, Nazi pig? Mein Kampf is a manifesto of a complete political program. I mean, they, they probably do say Nazi pig too, to refer to police, but <laughs> anyway. Nazism had a theory of racism and of the Aryan chosen people, a precise notion of degenerate art, in part Kunst, a philosophy of the will to power and of the Ubermensch. Nazism was decidedly anti-Christian and neo-pagan, while Stalin's Diamat, the official version of Soviet Marxism, was blatantly materialistic and atheistic. If by totalitarianism one means a regime that subordinates every act of the individual to the state and to its ideology, then both Nazism and Stalinism were true totalitarian regimes. 
Italian fascism was certainly a dictatorship, but it was not totally so totally reactive to neo-pagan as in people. A precise notion of degenerate art, entart Kunst, a philosophy of the will to power and of the Ubermensch. Nazism was decidedly anti-Christian and neo-pagan, while Stalin's Diamat, the official version of Soviet Marxism, was blatantly materialistic and atheistic. If by totalitarianism one means a regime that subordinates every act of the individual to the state and to its ideology, then both Nazism and Stalinism were true totalitarian regime. And this is where a lot of people get confused and, and say, oh, weren't the Nazis socialists? Well, no. There's a lot more to it than, than just having state power and state control. Um, in fact, communists would, would say that uh, the state as it is has to be dismantled and destroyed in order for uh, a, a true people state to be reconstituted. Oh, sure, Ali, I'll give you a shout out again. There you go. Yeah, Nazi, Nazi was National Socialist when they started because they were uh, in league with the Strasserites who, who did believe in a form of socialism for white people only and for, I mean, Germans really, uh, German white people only. Uh, but they were the first to be sent to the concentration camps. They were murdered en masse uh, after Hitler was done with them and had no, more, no further need for their, their power. So... Like I've been saying, not not fascism will superficially adopt any stance, any any ideology, and then discard it as soon as it's not relevant to the the task at hand. So, and also, movements can call themselves whatever they want. That doesn't mean they actually stand for what they say. Themes. Italian fascism was certainly a dictatorship but it was not totally totalitarian. Not because of its mildness, but rather because of the philosophical weaknesses of its ideology. Contrary to common opinion, fascism in Italy has no special philosophy. The article on fascism signed by Mussolini in the Trecani Encyclopedia was written or basically inspired by Giovanni Gentile, but it reflected a late Hegelian notion of the absolute and ethical state, which was never fully realized by Mussolini. Mussolini did not have any philosophy. He had only rhetoric. He was a militant atheist at the beginning and later signed the convention with the church and welcomed the bishops who blessed the fascist penance. And again, uh, in, in a lot of these fascist movements, that's what you'll see is, is no real ideology backing it up other than a want to, um, uh, yeah, as we know, don't trust labels. Uh, yeah, not much, not much of an ideology backing it up, just a, a desire to uh, strike at people who you believe have wronged you in some way and to keep yourself on top more than anything. Now, if you have anything to add here, Shanika, just feel, feel free to chime in as well. I don't know if you're still- Yeah, thanks. I, I think I'm sort of like, it, I'm probably just rolling all of the um, the terms around in my head because it's- Sure. Yeah, yeah, he's throwing a lot out of the beginning here. Yeah. All right. Well, we can mm -hmm. continue then. In his early anti-clerical years, according to a likely legend, he once asked God, in order to prove his existence, to strike him down on the spot. Later, Mussolini always cited the names of God in his speeches, and did not mind being called the Man of Providence. Italian fascism was the first right-wing dictatorship that took over a European country, and all similar movements later found a sort of archetype in Mussolini's regime. Italian fascism was first to establish a military liturgy, a folklore, even a way of dressing far more influential with its black shirts than Armani, Benetton, or Versace would ever be. It was only in the 30s that fascist movements appeared, with Mosley in Great Britain, and in Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Poland, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, Yugoslavia, Spain, Portugal, Norway, and even South America. It was Italian fascism that convinced many European liberal leaders that the new regime was carrying out interesting social reform, and that it was providing a mildly revolutionary alternative to the communist threat. Nevertheless, historical priority does not seem to me a sufficient reason to explain why the word fascism became a synecdoche, that is, a word that could be used for different totalitarian movements. This is not because fascism contained in itself, so to speak, in their quintessential state, all the elements of any later form of totalitarianism. On the contrary, fascism had no quintessence. Fascism was a fuzzy totalitarianism, a collage of different philosophical and political ideas, a beehive of contradictions. 
Can one conceive of a truly totalitarian movement that was able to combine monarchy with revolution, the royal army with Mussolini's personal militia, the grant of privileges to this church with state education extolling violence, absolute state control with a free market? The fascist party was born boasting that it brought a revolutionary new order, that it was financed by the most conservative among the landowners who expected from it a counter-revolution. At its beginning, fascism was republican, yet it survived for 20 years proclaiming its loyalty to the royal family, while the Duce, the unchallenged maximal leader, was arm in arm with the king, to whom he also offered the title of emperor. But when the king fired Mussolini in 1943, the party reappeared two months later with German support, under the standard of a social republic, recycling its old revolutionary script. So, so there we see again. As, as soon as a, a, a ideology or an allegiance is no longer useful, it's discarded, and you can just come back with, uh, you know, saying almost the opposite, uh, as, as long as it gets you more followers and more support. Uh, can, so can I tell you what this reminds me of? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like they're flying some sort of kite, right? And they mm -hmm. got to get it within the same, the right, um, you know, distance from the ground in order to catch sure. the wind. Mm -hmm. So you can't really see the wind or whatever, but you're definitely like moving around and sort of manipulating the kite to get there. And that's like basically how advertising works. Like that's how basically mm. any sort of mind control works is kind of get your, your, your message out, you know, Hey, you, you're going to tell everybody about bread theory. You're going to like try to figure out, well, who needs to hear this? Let me get my mm -hmm. message out to the right people in the right hands, etc. And hopefully it'll blow up. Right. And this, the way that this is being described, it's like, there's nothing to it. Like they're not. Yeah. You know, like it's it's church. I, I guess I'm just sort of like I'm reacting about it being like church. Like church is ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not if you believe in God. It's if you you know believe in God and just choose to cheat. If you believe in God and you but you still choose to go to church. If you but but you you have to believe in God. Like there's just no question. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's just, it's yeah, it's, it's a slippery thing to get your hands around and. Oh. Yeah, part of that part of that's by design because, as as we've seen with the alt right, as soon as you start like saying, "Oh, you're a Nazi," or "You believe in this or that," they'd be like, "No, we don't," or or these are just jokes. They use humor a lot. Uh, even the the rise of, of the Nazi party, they used ironic humor quite a bit to advance things that otherwise people would just be like, "Oh my God, that's deplorable. That, that that's that's horrific. The things you're saying." But they're like, "Oh no, we're just kidding. Oh, it's just edginess. Ha ha ha. Jokes, jokes, jokes." Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna compare that to another thing that reminds me of now that you said that is like the patri patriarchy and like kind of um, mm -hmm. mostly things like. I want to say sexism and like, sure. uh, you know, so if like, let's say guys are kind of standing around making jokes, they could always claim that they were joking. Like that happens. Like literally I can go outside and if in the right, you know, place, somebody's going to make a joke and then I'll call them out and they'll say that they were just playing. Yeah. And I'm just playing girl. I'm just trying to say hi. Yeah. So yeah, you're place, just being too uptight or that. Yeah. 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 And that sort of, it's like, I mean, it, it again like the reason why i labor so much to sort of ask questions like this is because i'm like i'm hearing you but i'm like still trying to you know what i mean i'm still trying to track where you're at what you mean and stuff and it's yeah, just like it, I'm, you know, I'm going in all these loopy -de loops and stuff with it because uh -huh. i still think about whoever it, it, you know is going to be asking well what is fascism like really like you know because you can't i mean you're defining it but yeah you know yeah <laughs> It's crazy, yeah. but yeah, with the just wanted to say with the sexism um, um, example, again, like that still plants the seeds because it's double speak. So while um, some, not all, guys are getting the message that oh yeah, you know, disrespect women, blah blah blah. It's not like anybody actually. I mean, I'm I'm not a guy. I don't know what happens behind closed doors, but you probably you're probably not getting a whole, you know, sit down message of like this is how you disrespect. Women. You're probably no, no, of course not. No. Right. See what I mean? Yeah. You're picking that up on the air, like mm -hmm. on the, on that little. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you're just inferring it from the way that other people have. Yeah, to. and you, and and at the same time as that being a whole lot of nothing that you can really pin down. Yeah. It's. I mean absolute. the. <laughs> and 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 the <laughs> radicalization process for a lot of, well, young men especially to these right-wing movements is, is very similar where like 
they're not just going to straight to 4chan and, and you know reading oh i'm getting some echo sorry let me turn you down let me turn you down in my in my uh okay go ahead sorry okay um so then i could just go straight to 4chan and like you know finding out all they can about about nazis or stuff like that it, it starts out some other place like they have some other sort of interest like you know gamergate became a big thing because of this that a lot of people just like talking about video games and stuff like that and then yeah. and then all of a sudden this group comes in starts making these these jokes and making these critiques but then always having the cover of like oh it's just jokes and stuff like that but then like you do it long enough and eventually you find that you start to believe it and it just kind of worms its way in i promise you like that's the reason why i'm i'm loving the whole marxism communism movement i am so sorry fellas folks ladies gals in between everybody for my misuse of terms but i promise you i love this shit yeah. <laughs> because yeah. i mean like you just described a scene from literally like the play slash movie chicago where mm. you know the lawyer is doing he says a tap dance so he's doing a dance, you know, and it's entertainment or whatever, but it, yep. it's getting across how he's he's basically made something true that wasn't true, but he sort of planted it in everybody's head. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. and of course they I Accepted. mean, again, being a Chicagoan, that's what that's where the label really comes from, for real. Like people from Chicago, oh, we're all we're all, you know, yeah, we're all flying kites and, and slightly sort of trying to drop things on you or whatever. But no, we're not like, but you see what I'm saying? So, yes. Yeah. Yeah, mind blowing to say the least. Awesome, that's great. And Ali <laughs> brings up Ali brings up a good point too. Uh, always punch up, not down in comedy. I I absolutely agree with that. And the reason being is is not that you know there are edgy jokes that are in poor taste that that I might find funny, um, but I I choose not to to laugh at them or encourage them because it leaves open the door for people that really believe this stuff to to come in and you know think that you're on their side and then so they tell another edgy joke and then just over time maybe even your own perception changes about the subject matter so so i agree uh i always always punch up so the people that have the power it's it's totally fine and good to to laugh at them to make jokes about them to take some of the wind out of their sails if for no other reason then rich people have some of the thinnest skin on earth uh but but also just because it, it 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 doesn't let in these sorts of nefarious movements that could have ul ulterior motives to be like you know to, to warm in their their really disgusting ideas and then before people know it they they have bought into a portion of it so can i just say i i think i will have to go soon but i just want oh, sure. to say like literally should i say ali ali osha your comment yeah. I'm really like kind of misty eyed because little things like that mean the world to me. It's like you're saying that it, there's always a coolness about making jokes and, and stuff. And I just want to say like, as, as a black woman, I won't make jokes about anyone except either myself or my own folks or like the occasional punching up of yeah. But it's not, I, I don't really get into like, I can't just roll around on the floor and be talking about just white folks for half an hour just because I'm just mm -hmm. sort of like not into it. I'll probably laugh at some stuff, but at the same time, just that little, I don't even know, like that little detail is everything. Mm -hmm. That punching up instead of, yeah, because it, there is a lot of punching down oh, happening yes. as in in all levels like remember that saying of it's it's local but it's it's universal but it's local at the same time like there's somebody who will make a joke with me personally mm -hmm. like tomorrow mm -hmm. or or next week or next month and they won't they'll they'll be punching down and they won't even think that there's anything wrong with it because they're what joking so yeah 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 so just wanted to say that I agree. Yeah, I can make fun of myself. I'll go for it. Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna follow follow you, Ali too. And um bye y'all and Yeah, Ali's great. <laughs> yeah, thanks for being on. I really appreciate it, Shanika. Thank um, you. Have a good night. See you Friday. See you Friday. All right. All right. Bye bye. Uh, oh wait, wait, wait. Razzle oh. Dazzle. I'll sing that one. <laughs> okay. Bye. Awesome.
Yeah. Bye. All right. Uh, that, that's really funny, James. Uh, rich people can't take jokes because they don't work and their skin is soft. And <laughs> like, literally, that's true. <laughs> See, and that's funny. And I mean, the other thing about punching down is usually it's like the easiest comedy possible. It's like, you know, this, this already marginal group that people probably have some misgivings about or some, some, you know, repulsion to, oh, say, oh, that, that group is, is repulsive. Ha ha ha. It's like in Always Sunny when they, they, their, their joke was always, you know, D's a bird, D's a bird. It's, it's the same, it's literally the same joke again and again and again. Um, and the joke was just that they found her repulsive. It's just, it's really easy. And, you know, I think they, they were trying to be ironic about it and show you're not supposed to like any of the, the characters or, or want to be like any of the characters and always sunny, but, uh, it's just kind of pointing out that punching down is really easy and, and boring. Um, it's, it's, and, and you will find this in right wing movements that when it comes down to it, they have like two or three jokes and that's it. As, especially the, the more hardcore ones, it'll be like, you know, free helicopter rides, which is a, a reference to, um, Pinochet, who supposedly flew people out over the ocean, his enemies, and drowned them out of helicopters. So yeah, real funny. Um, and then I identify as an attack helicopter to shame trans people. They'll just say that one again and again and again. Again, a really easy target because trans people are in the public eye right now. And there's a lot of misunderstanding confusion and and fear surrounding them so it's it's really easy to say oh a trans person ha 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 um and you know that they'll be like a couple of the jokes just like that and they'll just repeat it endlessly endlessly as though it's it's always new and fresh uh but it's not it's just boring so if you if you want actual good comedy you have to actually think about you know, the systems that underlie it, uh, you know, you have to, to get to some truth, maybe that people didn't even know that they knew. And that takes more effort. And that usually, you know, is going to make you end up punching up rather than down. <laughs> Don't take your life too seriously. You'll never get out of a life. That's very funny. Allie. Bugs Bunny quote. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, you have to have humor just to soften the edges of what can be a, a not so soft world yeah 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 there's plenty of jokes made about will smith smacking chris rock and like again he was punching down chris rock was punching down when he made that joke look your wife is bald ha 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 it is like the most obvious thing it's not, it was not a good joke. It was not really funny and it was punching down. Um, and that, that tends to be how it is <laughs> with reactionary jokes, but getting back to the book, we're almost halfway. Now in doing pretty good. almost Jacobin overtones, there was only a single Nazi architecture and a single Nazi art. If the Nazi architect was Albert Speer, there was no more room for Mies van der Rohe. Still, very, Similarly, very in unimaginative and boring. If Lamarck was right, there was no room for Darwin. In Italy, there were certainly fascist architects, but close to the pseudo Colosseums were many new buildings inspired by the modern rationalism of Gropius. There were no fascist Znadov setting a strictly cultural line. In Italy, there were two important art awards. The Premio Cremona was controlled by a fanatical and uncultivated fascist, Roberto Farinacci, who's, who encouraged art as propaganda. I can well, that's the thing, is if you're, if you're just looking backwards forever to some imagined, idealized past, and then you apply that to art, you're just going to end up repeating that again and again and again. There's, there's going to be no new art, no, no different ways of looking at things or new ideas, because the past doesn't change. You might be able to unearth parts of it that you, you previously didn't have access to, but that's about as good as you can hope for. And so, Nazi art, fascist art, tends to be rather bland and boring because they're not saying anything new or different. So they just end up repeating 
in the past again and again and again. You can remember paintings with such titles as Listening by Radio to the Duce's Speech or States of Mind Created by Fascism. Uh, uh, uh. It's not, it's not uh, transcribing that word. It's, it's not the Duchess speech, it's the Duce. Uh, uh, Mussolini, in case you didn't know, was referred to as Il Duce. The Premio Bergamo was sponsored by the cultivated and reasonably tolerant fascist Giuseppe Bottai, who protected both the concept of art for art's sake and many kinds of avant-garde art that had been banned as corrupt and crypto-communist in Germany. The national poet was Denuncio, a dandy who in Germany or in Russia would have been sent to the firing squad. He was appointed as the bard of the regime because of his nationalism and his cult of heroism, which were in fact abundantly mixed up with the influence of French fin de siècle decadence. Take futurism. One might think it would have been considered an instance of entart kunst, along with expressionism, cubism, and surrealism, but the early Italian futurists were nationalist. They favoured Italian participation in the First World War for aesthetic reasons. They celebrated speed, violence, and risk, all of which somehow seemed to connect with the fascist cult of youth. While fascism identifies itself with the Roman Empire and rediscovered rural traditions, Marinetti, who proclaimed that a car was more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace and wanted to kill even the moonlight, was nevertheless appointed as a member of... <laughs> I don't think it means that in American, but that, that is what I always think when I hear it. Uh, what, what does it mean, though? I should probably know. I think it probably means... Duke? Ah, oh, Duce is an Italian title derived from the Latin word dux, or dux probably, leader. So, yeah, cognitive duke. There we go. So duke or leader, that's, that's what it translates to. But I prefer Duce, or, or Duce, or Douche. <laughs> that's, that's a more accurate translation. Of the Italian Academy, which treated Moonlight with great respect. Many of the future partisans and of the future intellectuals of the Communist Party were educated by the GUF, the Fascist University Students Association, which was supposed to be the cradle of the new fascist culture. These clubs became a sort of intellectual melting pot, where new ideas circulated without any real ideological control. It was not that the men of the party were tolerant of radical thinking, but few of them had the intellectual equipment to control it. During those 20 years, the poetry of Montal and other writers associated with the group called the Eremitici was a reaction to the bombastic style of the regime, and these poets were allowed to develop their literary protest from within what was seen as their ivory tower. The mood of the Eremitici poets was exactly the reverse of the fascist cult of optimism and heroism. The regime tolerated their blatant, even though socially imperceptible, dissent from because the fascists simply did not pay attention to such arcane language. The regime tolerated their blatant, even though socially imperceptible, dissent because the fascists simply did not pay attention to such arcane language. All this did not mean that Italian fascism was tolerant. Gramsci was put in prison until his death. The opposition leaders Giacomo Matteotti and the brothers Rosselli were assassinated. The free press was abolished. The labor unions were dismantled, and political dissenters were confined on remote islands. Legislative power became a mere fiction, and the executive power, which controlled the judiciary as well as the mass media, directly issued new laws. Among them laws calling for the preservation of the race, the formal Italian gesture of support for what became the Holocaust. So here we go. Uh, scapegoating again, appeal to, to, to tradition, um, and just the, the centralizing and concentration of as much power as possible. Suppressing the press, suppressing artists, suppressing anyone who spoke out in any way against the regime. You can't even say things against the regime, let alone act against it. The contradictory picture I described was not the result of tolerance, but of political and ideological discombobulation. But it was a rigid discombobulation. A structured confusion. Fascism was philosophically out of joint, but emotionally, it was firmly fastened to some archetypal foundations. So we come to my second point. There was only one Nazism. We cannot label Franco's hyper-Catholic phalangism as Nazism, since Nazism is fundamentally pagan, polytheistic, and anti-Christian. But the fascist game can be played in many forms, and the name of the game does not change. The notion of fascism is not unlike Wittgenstein's notion of a game. A game can be either competitive or not. It can require some special skill or none. It can or cannot involve money. Games are different activities that display only some family resemblance, as Wittgenstein put it. Consider the following sequence. 1, 2, 3, 4. A, B, C, B, C, D, C, D, E, D, E, F. Suppose there is a series of political groups in which group 1 is characterized by the features A, B, C, group 2 by the features B, C, D, and so on. Group 2 is similar to group 1 since they have two features in common. For the same reasons, 3 is similar to 2 and 4 is similar to 3. Notice that 3 is also similar to 1, they have in common the feature C. The most curious case is presented by 4, obviously similar to 3 and 2, but with no feature in common with 1. 
However, owing to the uninterrupted series of decreasing similarities between 1 and 4, there remains, by sort of illusory transitivity, a family resemblance between 4. Okay, so if you're getting confused with all the numbers and, and, and the uh, words like transitivity being thrown around, all he's saying is that you have these different manifestations and they, each one of them has something in common with most every other one. Some have nothing in common with another particular one, uh, but they all have things in common with other groups. And that's, again, why it's so hard to pin down what a fascist movement actually is, because one fascist movement may bear little resemblance superficially to another one. Um, like, he, like he was saying, you might have uh, in, in, the, in the Nazi instance a, a, an appeal to a neo-pagan movement, whereas in another one it might be uh, more Christian-oriented or something like that. Certainly seeing a, a rise of, of a brand of Christian fasc fascism in, in the United States with all of the uh, rolling back of rights and, and that sort of thing based on more biblical ideas. Or interpretations of biblical ideas. So, but but that's not to say that it has nothing in, in common with um, Nazism or fascist or, or other fascist movements. It's just that the the way that they manifest are different. Um, I think maybe an a, an apt analogy would be there's many ways that that mushrooms manifest their their fruiting body, right? So the fruiting body is the part that you see of a mushroom. Um, but they all, they're all mushrooms. They, they come in many different forms. Some have, you know, lattice work that comes off of them. Some of them uh, are, you know, one color or another color. They grow in different places. They have different textures. But you can look at all the mushrooms put together and you can say, oh yeah, these all look like mushrooms. So they have something that, that is, is true for all of them even if it's hard to tell from the parts that you, you can see, because they're, because, you know, also they're, they're, it's not a root structure, it's a mycelial structure, but they all have that in common. In, in fact, I think for the most part, mushrooms are, most of their biomass is underground. So I think that is something they could all have in common. Um, I don't know, maybe that's an awkward analogy, but just thought I'd try it out. Four and one. Fascism became an all-purpose term because one that can eliminate from a fascist regime one or more features, and it will still be recognizable as fascist. Take away imperialism from fascism, and you still have Franco and Salazar. Take away colonialism, and you still have the Balkan fascism of the Ustaches. Add to the Italian fascism of radical anti-capitalism, which never much fascinated Mussolini, and you have Ezra Pound. Add a cult of Celtic mythology and the Grail mysticism, completely alien to official fascism, and you have one of the most respected fascist gurus, Julius Evola. But in spite of this fuzziness, I think it's impossible to outline a list of features that are typical of what I would like to call Ur-Fascism, or Eternal Fascism. These features cannot be organised into a system, many of them contradict each other, and are also typical of other kinds of despotism or fanaticism, but it is only enough that one of them be present to allow fascism to coagulate around. Only enough that one of them be present. Not necessarily all of them, but just one of them. Just want to re-emphasise that bit. One. The first feature of Ur fascism is the cult of tradition. Traditionalism is of course much older than fascism. Not only was it typical of counter-revolutionary Catholic thought after the French Revolution, but it was born in the late Hellenistic era, as a reaction to the classic Greek rationalism. In the Mediterranean basin, people of different religions, most of them indulgently accepted by the Roman pantheon, started dreaming of a revelation received at the dawn of human history. This revelation, according to the traditionalist mystique, had remained for a long time concealed under the veil of forgotten languages, in Egyptian hieroglyphs, in the Celtic runes, in the scrolls of the little-known religions of Asia. This new culture had to be syncretistic. Syncretism is not only, as the dictionary says, the combination of different forms of belief or practice. Such a combination must tolerate contradictions. Each of the original messages contains a sliver of wisdom, and whenever they seem to say different or incompatible things, it is only because all are alluding, allegorically, to the same primeval truth. As a consequence, there can be no advancement of learning. Truth has already been spelled out once and for all, and we can only keep interpreting its obscure message. One has only to look at the syllabus of every fascist movement to find the major traditionalist thinkers. The Nazi gnosis was nourished by traditionalist, syncretistic, occult elements. 
The most influential theoretical source of the theories of the new Italian rite, Julius Evola, merged the Holy Grail with the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, alchemy with the Holy Roman and Germanic Empire. The very fact that the Italian rite, in order to show its open-mindedness, recently brought it into its syllabus to include works by De Maestra, Guénon, and Gramsci, it is a blatant proof of syncretism. If you browse in the shelves that, in American bookstores, are labelled as New Age, you can find that even St. Augustine, who, as far as I know, was not a fascist, but combining St. Augustine and Stonehenge, that is a symptom of fascism. 2. Traditionalism implies the rejection of modernism. Both fascists and Nazis worship technology, while traditionalists think- So you'll see this as a meme a lot, in a lot of places, uh, usually without any sort of context given to it, but it's, it's, uh, the form goes, um, reject modernism, embrace, is it, oh, no, I'm gonna flub it, aren't I? I think it's, uh, reject modernism, embrace tradition. Reject modernism, embrace tradition. Something like that. And you'll see it applied to all sorts of things, oftentimes ironically, but this is all where it comes from. It originally was a fascist saying. Let's see if we can even find the, the, the direct origin of it. Oh, modernity. Reject modernity, embrace tradition. So let's let's put it up. See, I know your meme usually does a good job of getting into this, into uh, the history of it. Okay. Well, that's not really a great history of it, so Know Your Meme does not do it justice. So I'm not finding it real quickly, but reject modernity, embrace tradition. Even if it's being used ironically, at least now you know that this is a, a fascist origin, and it was meant <laughs> literally. Not just uh, ironically. So anytime, uh, and, and this is important that, so that anytime you get into a group, if you start seeing these sorts of jokes happening a lot, um, it should at least send up a red flag. Now, now chances are because it has been, you know, ironically co-opted by the left, that uh, that could also be the case that they're just using it ironically, as a way to make fun of. Uh, of fascists and, and reactionaries, but, you know, be on your guard a little bit. ...think is usually rejected as a negation of traditional spiritual values. However, even though Nazism was proud of its industrial achievements, its praise of modernism was only the surface of an ideology based upon blood and earth. The rejection of the modern world was disguised as a rebuttal of the capitalistic way of life, but it mainly concerned the rejection of the spirit of 1789, and of course, 1776. The Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, is seen as the beginning of modern depravity. In this yeah, so it, it, it's fine with a lot of modern technologies that can allow it to enact violence on its, its enemies, uh, but it doesn't like all of the philosophy that, that tended to accompany um, such movements of, of what, what today could be called neoliberalism, uh, enlightenment sort of, of thinkers that, you know, the idea that the individual is important, uh, that the individual has some responsibility and agency in their own life, um, stuff like that. Sense of fascism can be defined as irrationalism. Three, irrationalism also depends on the cult of action for action's sake. Action being beautiful in itself, it must be taken before or without any previous reflection. Thinking is a form of emasculation, therefore culture is suspect insofar as it is identified with critical attitudes. Distrust of the intellectual world has always been a symptom of her fascism. From Goering's original statement, When I hear talk of culture, I reach for my gun. Here we go. So, so emphasis on, on uh, feelings over facts. So, I mean, it's, it's quite ironic that, that Ben Shapiro, who embraces, embraces much of the, the, the uh, ideology of, of fascism, um, has that as his rallying cry that facts don't care about your feelings because if you actually look into any of the things he says it's virtually all feeling uh, he feels that the trans people are icky and so he will uh, uh, ridicule them endlessly 
he, he feels that that uh, women should be controlled in their bodies and, and therefore should not be able to have abortions because he feels that that you know life begins at conception and and, and somehow that's sacred even though he doesn't seem to care much about the lives of the the boring people but but again that, that that's thinking too much you, you, you're putting too much thought into it not enough just emotion and when you just act impulsively all the time I mean that's that's another word for just action without thought is just being incredibly impulsive and people that that live this way in their lives tend to end up getting in a lot of trouble because they don't think through what what they're going to do and so they don't know where they're going and oftentimes it's going to end up in a way that that hurts somebody they're, they're going to end up doing something that hurts somebody else um, but this is this is a feature of fascism because it 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 promotes the violence that it's seeking to enact on its enemies and it gets just kind of a a falling in line oh thank you so much for the the raid alios or welcome in raiders I'm not gonna. I'm gonna go about uh, ten more minutes here, but we're just looking at Earth Fascism by Umberto Eco. So, if you've ever been curious about this text and and some ways that you can see warning signs of, of fascist movements encroaching on your life and in your movements, uh, this is this is a good place to to reach for an introductory text. It's like a, it's a, this is a very good intro. And as I've said many times on this stream, it is not the end all be all definition of what fascism is and in fact probably about five minutes I'll, I'll start wrapping things up and I'll give another couple of books of, of recommendations for further reading um, even though we're not even going to finish this this book tonight but but still if you if you if you got all this stuff so far and you want to dive deeper deeper into it I got a couple books in mind that I will share so there are frequent use of such expressions as degenerate intellectuals egghead Okay, and and so here we here we have another term that you might have seen thrown out thrown around the internet quite a bit, and it's degenerate. And this is another one that the left, I believe erroneously, has has decided to co-opt ironically. So they you know they'll they'll call right wingers degenerates because they they think it's funny and stuff like that. But I think this is a very dangerous one to be using, in any sense, uh, because it immediately puts your opponent as less than human and I, and I don't think that's a good road to lead down because every major human atrocity has started by uh, defining the, the the target of the atrocity as subhuman this is this is what what um, you know mass shooters use to to justify their actions this is what people that attract uh, attack trans people use to justify their actions um, again and again and again, you will see the subhumanization of people. So even if it starts out, uh, you know, you know, saying like, "Oh, landlords are, are parasites and stuff like that," and that, that that can be funny and that sort of thing. But if you start really dehumanizing people that just happen to be landlords, um, you might end up justifying a lot more violence than. Is, is productive in any sort of way by any measure so I I like to just steer clear of, of degenerates as, as any sort of an insult even when I'm trying to throw it back in the, in the face or even when I could throw it back in the face of a reactionary I just I don't feel it's a good word and I don't feel it's a word that can be rehabilitated and used for a good purpose continuing on it's effort snobs. Universities are in nests of reds. The official fascist intellectuals were mainly engaged in attacking modern culture. And the yeah, and look at that too. They, they, they went after the intellectuals, though some, uh, some of the other first targets of fascism, um, wherever these, these movements really gained a stranglehold, they would attack intellectuals because they had the ability to think and, and reason and refute the, the you know, nothing ideologies that the fascists were putting forward and so this this flies in the face of of action for action's sake it flies in the face of of acting without thinking um so those those people are seen immediately as enemies because they could change people's minds they could get them to stop and and slow down their thinking and, and perhaps come to a more 
rational point of view than just let's attack those people because those people are ruining our lives or those people are responsible for the downfall of Western civilization. Um, and, and you see this sort of rhetoric being used by, by the likes of Jordan Peterson recently when he said that <laughs> his personal philosophy or, or theory is that uh, a large reason that, that Russia went to war with Ukraine was because of a rejection of Western wokeism and that they thought that the, the, that, that the Ukrainians were getting too close with uh, Westerners and that they would, they would infect Ukraine and then, and then by proxy Russia with woke ideology. So this is, this, this is a, a repudiation of wokeism. And that's why they went to war based on nothing. And, and, that's, and that's it. If you're already swallowing Peterson's BS and you're just going to take whatever he says at face value, then, then you'd be like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. Oh, yeah, that's probably what's happening. Uh, and you won't really put much thought into it. If you stop to think about it for half a second, even Putin didn't ever say that. <laughs> like, when he was coming up with, with, you know, flimsy excuses for invading Ukraine, he didn't say at any time, Oh, and by the way, they're, 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 they're accepting the West woke ideology, and we need to, to push back against that. So this is just based on nothing. And if you think about Peterson's statements for half a second, you'll find that most of them are based on nothing at all. We did a video of his just the other night, where his, his big revelation of, of why you should go to church, uh, the topic was why you should go to church, but his big revelation in, in relation to that was that Catholics are always the most sane because they have one foot in the dream, in the, the mystery. He didn't explain what that meant, uh, but, and he never, he never went back to that phrase again. He just threw it out there as though this is something like, oh, of course, oh, well, all, the, all the puzzle pieces are really falling into place now. And, and, and he just kind of glossed over it after that point. He just skipped on to his next point without really elaborating or, or putting anything on it. But stop and think about it. Try and Try and diagram that sentence. Catholics are the most sane because they have one foot in the dream, in the mystical, or in the mystery. I don't, I don't remember which word he used, <coughs> but it was one of the two. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean at all? How, how how does having a foot in the dream relate to one being sane or, or insane? How do Catholics have one foot in the dream? What is the dream that he's speaking of? Because they're praying is 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 it like a a a a, a spiritual state of uh, of of heightened being that he's referring to. He, he did not explain it. So so yeah. Uh, That, that's Jordan Peterson, though, for you. He, he, he puts all this, this stuff to basically just baffle you with bullshit and, and hope that if he uses enough terms, especially academic terms, then he can plaster over the fact that he's not really saying anything. <laughs> but those, those are his ideas, one after another. You give it the, little bit of, the least little bit of pushback, and it just phew, evaporates into a fine mist. Liberal intelligentsia for having betrayed traditional values. No syncretistic faith can withstand analytical criticism. The critical spirit makes distinctions, and to distinguish is a sign of modernism. Four. No syncretism. We're going to end at number four, because uh, I, I need to, to get to bed. Um, i draw this too close, and I promised that I would share some links to other books about fascism and, and identifying it and, and really getting a better hold of, of what it is. And so the first one I want to share is The Anatomy of Fascism, by uh, Robert Paxton, and this is a much more in-depth version of what Echo is looking at in this text. And he too wrestles with it a lot because, yeah, the, these are all thought of as fascist movements, the, the Italians, the, the Spanish to a, a lesser extent, but I, I'm pretty confident to put them in there, the Argentinians and um, the Germans as well as some other more minor ones. They're all called fascism, but, but they, they each have their own 
unique flavor that that you know one to another might not have a whole lot of superficial elements in common so he wrestles with it a lot in this book too but it's 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 a much longer text and he dives more deeply into it so i think that's that's a, that's a great next step if this has given you a good taste of of the theory and you want some more and the other one uh not as much directly about identifying fascism although it does cover it somewhat but this is this one is more about how to orient yourself against fascism uh, and how to build an anti-fascist culture into you know, whatever it is that you're you're interested in whether it's a, a political movement whether it's just you know being a sports fan and he talks a lot about um, developing anti-fascist sports clubs just just making it kind of a, a built-in part of everyday life to be anti-fascist and that is is um, Antifa or Antifa the anti-fascist handbook by Mark Bray a real good one also a, a, a shorter one too I think I got through it through the audiobook in maybe a day or two so not too bad at all so those are my recommendations as you can see scrolling across the bottom we're having a, a karaoke night on Friday uh, 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. So this time on Friday, uh, make sure to be here. It's going to be live only. It's not going to be a recording put up afterward. At least I don't have one planned to put up. Um, and we're just going to get together and, and, you know, do some karaoke live on Twitch. And if you're interested in, in participating, there is a link that I can share. Um for the, the, the Facebook announcement of the event. It will not be on Facebook, the event itself, but it is listed on Facebook, if that makes sense. Oops, that's not the right link. So there you go. So if you wanna make sure that, that you get into the song rotation, you wanna make sure that your favorite song is is available um, and that no one's taking it yet that's that's the place to go to that Facebook link and uh, you can go check out what other people are gonna plan on singing I'm, I'm planning on starting to kick off the event with uh, the the jazz swing the Tony Babino uh, version of the International I've been practicing it so so hopefully I'm <laughs> hopefully I'm at least on key that that if I can get through all of it being on, you know, in key or on key. Yeah, see, I don't even know about enough about music to know whether it's in key or I guess it is in key, isn't it? I will, I will count that as a win. Um, that's oh, that's too bad, James. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see because I, I will make a recording of it myself. I will, when I use this this program that I use this this restream program, it does automatically make a recording. So I might test the waters and see if we can. Uh, get it approved by by YouTube even if I have to you know demonetize I don't care about demonetizing it I just don't want to get a copyright strike but if I can if I can get a version a demonetized version up on YouTube after then I then I will but uh, no promises um, and if you can't make it this Friday uh, well I'm my hope is to make this a regular thing like maybe a a, a fourth Friday of the month sort of a, a deal or or maybe have it on different days if people's schedules just can't work out with Fridays. Um, and maybe be hosted by, by other streamers as well. Um, we'll just have to kind of see where things go and, and how successful it is. But I'm, I'm, I got big hopes for it. Got about uh, 10 confirmed singers in the rotation and, and about 30 or 40 more people that are interested in the event. So, you know, that, that's promising so far. Either way, you get to see me sing for sure, and and a few of my friends too, and my wife, she's she's gonna sing something as well. So yeah, just a way to kind of unwind and and build some friendships, um, have kind of a, a low stakes, low pressure sort of environment to just kind of hang out. Um, and it doesn't have to be a leftist song either. It can be you know you if you really want to sing, um, the latest Taylor Swift or whatever or Justin Bieber you just you sing your heart out that that's totally fine it is it is leftist first and foremost because it's leftist getting together and only secondarily because some of the songs that we will sing will be explicitly leftist songs but anyway I look forward to seeing you all then 
Uh, that should be the next time that I stream, because uh, I do have to work Friday, unfortunately. And yeah, I'm really excited for it. And hopefully you, you will all show up. Let's see who we should raid into right now. So we do have a couple of people hanging out in the Twitch. Let's see who's on right now. Hmm. Echoplex Media is a possibility. Or poly people. You know what? Actually, I'm going to do something different. We will pick Moving Train Radio. This is a Twitch channel that just plays leftist uh, speeches, interviews, and and songs constantly. That, that's all it is. It's, it's just basically just a Twitch radio station. So it's kind of getting you, getting you in the mood, getting you some ideas for Friday. I will, uh, I will recommend them. I'll put them in the chat right here, the full thing, and then we will start the raid into their channel. There we go. Thank you all for joining me, and I really hope to see y'all. Friday. It's going to be a good time. Even if you're just in the audience clapping along, making your your uh, you know, cheer reactions and whatnot, it, it, sh it should be great. <laughs> 